You guys are dismissed. <laughs> this morning we are continuing our series through the book of Acts. We're going to be um, looking at Acts 1, verses 4 through 8. And so go ahead and turn there. This is Luke's account of the continued works of Jesus, this book of Acts. We ended last week noticing that Luke emphasizes how this is a continued story of the kingdom of God. We saw the demonstration, the living out or display of that kingdom in Luke's first book through the life of Jesus, God's Son, the Messiah. And Jesus preached the kingdom and it says that He brought the kingdom. Luke 8, verse 1, soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. In Luke 11, verse 20, he says, Jesus is speaking, he says, but if by the finger of God that, but, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And this second work of Luke, the book of Acts, continues that story. In fact, we saw last week how Luke intentionally begins and ends this second book with the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 1, verse 3, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of of God. And then the very end of the book, the last two verses, chapter 28, verses 30 and 31, he lived there, speaking of Paul, two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. This is Luke's way in writing of saying the story continues. This is still the story I was telling about the kingdom of God coming in Christ. So we're going to get to the text today and see how the story continues. If you wouldn't uh, mind standing, if you're able to stand, go ahead and do that and follow along as I read Acts 1 beginning with verse 4. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. It's a gift to us, and it is truth. We praise You that we, we can come to it and learn about You. We can find You through it. We ask for your help today, that you'd help us to have our hearts and our minds opened to the truth of your word, that you speak to us, Lord. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. We saw last week, as we see in verse 4 here, Jesus met with his followers, with the disciples, after the resurrection. We should pause and, and just consider that. The risen Lord died. The third day is raised to life. Didn't immediately ascend to heaven, but stays. He remains here on earth with the disciples, teaching them, directing them, proving to them that He was alive, that He did, in fact, come back to life. And these once fearful and disillusioned and doubting disciples are with Him. It says, for 40 days, they are with 
the risen Jesus. He remained with them. That's a gift. Luke writes here, while staying with them. That, that verb can mean to eat at the same table with or to assemble, to come together. And such a needed and gracious gift from the Lord Jesus to these followers and to us. Because it proved to them that he was alive, and then that truth that he was alive was passed on to others, who passed it on to others, who passed it on to others. Until today, we have this blessing of knowing that Jesus lives. And Jesus tells the disciples to stay put, to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. And that promise of God is the Holy Spirit. We see that in the next verse. It's anticipating the coming of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2, where the gift of the Spirit is poured out on the disciples of Jesus and connected to the announcement by Joel the prophet. In Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my Spirit. Now, we're going to get into that text as we get into farther into chapter 2, but this is the promise by Jesus of that fulfillment. It's coming. Verse 5, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. These disciples are about to discover the Spirit as a new and powerful reality in their own lives. Luke says here, Jesus pointed them back to the very beginning of His earthly ministry when John the Baptist called for Israel to repent and be baptized. And Jesus says that the coming of the Spirit is going to be like that. Not that they're going to be immersed in water like the baptism of John, but rather they're going to be immersed in the Holy Spirit. This monumental event that will identify them and unite them as the people of God, the kingdom people who reflect the king. So Jesus says, wait. Wait in Jerusalem for that to happen. You can imagine how the disciples might have wanted to just take off and go tell people this man who died before our very eyes, is alive. Tell people all about what had happened and that the true king of the whole earth was Jesus. But Jesus says to them, wait. And that might have been hard for them, but it's necessary. It's unwise for people to jump to do things apart from the direction, power, and work of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus is telling them to wait for. His his encouragement includes, it's going to happen soon. It's going to happen not many days from now. In verse 6, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, this is a window into their thinking and to their understanding. This is what the disciples are still thinking about the coming of the kingdom. Now, their understanding and and really their foundation of faith has changed and, and been strengthened, but they're still not thinking right. But imagine, the things that have, that have happened and that they've experienced with Jesus Just in the last weeks of their lives, those things didn't correspond with their understanding of the coming of the Messiah. They really did believe at this point that Jesus was the Messiah to come, the true King of Israel. But what did that mean? 
What does it mean that He's the Messiah? They believed that God was going to restore Israel and the whole world would be made right, which meant that Israel would be on top. And all others would submit to them. Now, in the lives of these disciples, that belief has taken some shots over the last week. The Messiah being arrested, the Messiah being convicted, the Messiah being beaten and abused and mocked and crucified and dead. The Messiah dead. Well, in their, their devastated minds, they, they're certainly thinking, well, that must mean he wasn't actually the one. But now he's alive again, so maybe he is the one. And all of this theology, and, and right or wrong, it, it's their theology. It's what they're thinking about God. It results in them asking this question of Jesus, is it now? Is it time, Lord? Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So we can see that they haven't truly understood the significance yet of the resurrection. But we can also understand that. We can relate to them in this. Because their tribe... Their circle has taught them certain things that are hard to unlearn. Every single person in this room can relate to that. Whether we know it or not, there are things like this question here, things that that have been uh, taught to us, things we've been led to believe that aren't biblical or true, that we need to unlearn. Things we need to understand rightly. And that's true for every single one of us. Whether we know what they are or not. We don't have, we don't have full, perfect understanding of the Scriptures. And so they ask Jesus, coming from, from what they've learned from their tribe, from their circle, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And what would that mean? As they understood it, what would that mean? Well, it's A.D. 30. So Judea is ruled by a Roman governor. We know who that is, Pontius Pilate. And Galilee is ruled by Herod Antipas, who was tetrarch from B.C. 4 to A.D. 39. Well, these disciples' expectations and the Jews' expectations would mean the elimination of those Roman rulers and the uniting of the regions of Israel. And in their minds, that's good news. But that isn't the way of Jesus. That's not the way of Jesus. Jesus had taught them that they would have to lose their lives for His sake. They'd have to lose their lives to save their lives. And the truth of the kingdom is empowered and explained through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it, Jesus says. And so now Jesus, in a sense, needs to help them realign their priorities They had to lose their kingdom dreams, their nationalistic kingdom-mindedness in order to gain the true kingdom of Christ because they're not understanding. God's kingdom is coming in Jesus and through the work of Jesus by the transformation of this world through Him. So these disciples have to renounce their nationalistic kingdom-mindedness in order to gain the true kingdom of Christ. That's what we see in these next verses of how transformation is truly coming. Verse 
7, he said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. That's not for you to know, Jesus says. And truly, it's not for us to know. We are still called, as the disciples were called, to lose our lives for his sake. Not to seek to build kingdoms here. There is a kingdom that we're a part of already in Christ. Not to claim to know times and seasons, but to follow Jesus. The fact that I'm preaching to you this sermon today means that another prediction of the Lord's return has come and gone and was proven wrong. If you didn't know, it was yesterday. We're here. Does that mean he's not coming back? Absolutely not. He's coming back. But it reminds us again that that's not our focus. It's not for us to know times and seasons. We're not supposed to be determining when. Our focus is who. Our focus is who, not when. Verse 8 continues, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. But, Jesus says, it's not for you to know those things, but here is the hope, here is the focus. Jesus is saying, disciples, don't worry about times and seasons. Rather, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you're going to be my witnesses. That's the focus the disciples should have. You're going to receive power, and you'll be my witnesses from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. There's a global nature of the kingdom of God, and Jesus points their attention to that, that that is their role. They're to proclaim the person and work of the risen Christ to all the world. And so to answer their question, Jesus is saying that the restoration of God's rule in Israel begins with the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Luke recorded in his first book, the Gospel of Luke, that Jesus told them that the Spirit is the power from on high in Luke 24, verse 49. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Here in Acts, he's saying you will receive power. You're going to be clothed in power from on high when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So let's notice what Jesus is teaching them here. Two things that Jesus is teaching them here. First, their power will come from the immersion or um, clothing with the Holy Spirit. They're going to be immersed in or clothed with the Holy Spirit. And second, that power will result in being heralds of the kingdom of God. First, their power will come from the immersion in or clothing with the Holy Spirit. That's certainly what Jesus is telling them here. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. On their own, they're not able to accomplish the new and renewing work of God in the advancement of His kingdom to all people and all nations. That's why Jesus tells them to wait. They're not equipped yet. They're not ready yet to fulfill this great mission of God. But when the Spirit comes, when they're baptized, when they're immersed in the Holy Spirit, they will receive power. That's why we see such an incredible journey that takes place in Acts. We're going to see in the coming chapters, these these once fearful men who hid 
in an upper room because they thought for sure the religious leaders were coming to get them next, will go out in faith heralding the kingdom of God. It's why Peter, who out of fear denied Jesus three times, will boldly proclaim the death and resurrection of Jesus to these same people who killed him. Jesus says, wait. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, you'll receive power, and then you'll be my witnesses. Power to do what I'm commissioning you to do. And secondly, that power will result in them being heralds of the kingdom of God. That's what a witness is, a herald. Jesus has been raised from the dead and through the resurrection and the ascension that's about to happen. Jesus is enthroned as Israel's Messiah and the king of the whole world. The king, Jesus, is on his throne. And he is the one at whose name every knee shall bow. Paul writes that in Philippians 2 verses 9 through 11, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the first century, whenever someone was enthroned as king, what would happen? Heralds would go out throughout the land and announce over and over, we have a king. And it didn't matter who it was, Nero or Claudius, whoever it was, whether they were good or bad, we have a king. And they would go and announce it and demand glad allegiance from supposedly grateful subjects. But those were earthly kingdoms with sometimes wicked rulers. And Jesus is saying, it's time to realign things. It's time to think differently. You're now going out with power, he says to the disciples, to herald the new king, to herald the true king, the king who's good, the king who's benevolent, and you're to call people to give their happy allegiance to him and only him. That's what a herald does. That's what it means to be a witness for Jesus. And he gives the apostles this agenda. First, First, you're going to do that in Jerusalem, and then Judea, the surrounding countryside, and then Samaria, the hated foreigners living next door to them, and then the ends of the earth. And that means everyone, those they knew and loved and those they didn't know who, who they previously or maybe presently hated. It's a self-denying and Christ-exalting call that He is the King. A call to put to death their affections and allegiance to nationalistic identity and to understand what it actually truly means for Christ to be King. To buy, for Christ to be King of their hearts of their purpose, of their agendas. And they're going to need power for that. They need power for that. We all need power for that. And Jesus says it's coming in the Spirit. N.T. Wright comments here, God has all authority. We don't have that ultimate authority. No human in whatever task or role ever does. But what God's people are promised is power. 
The word used here is the word from which we get dynamite. We need that power, just as Jesus' followers did. If we or they are to be witnesses, to find ways of announcing to the world that He is already its rightful King and Lord, we need that power. What Jesus is saying here is that the Holy Spirit, just as as He described in John chapter 14, John chapter 15, John chapter 16, The Spirit's purpose is to glorify, to magnify, to make known Christ. That is the Spirit's purpose. Not self, not selfish identifications, not worldly kingdoms, but the kingdom of Jesus. Jesus gives them their agenda, and that agenda will result in a kingdom that encompasses the whole world. You see that fulfilled in John's vision in Revelation 7. In verse 9, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. These are people that John is describing, multitudes of people who have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves. And Jesus alone is King. who've heard the truth that Jesus is the true King and is enthroned forever, people who have believed and trusted in Him. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus told these disciples, you're going to receive power and you're going to be my witnesses. You're going to herald the kingdom. And we have the blessing and an opportunity to carry on that call, to herald the King. To announce that we have a king. As we seek to display his kingdom and his kingdom qualities to those around us. To those we come in contact with. Qualities that reflect the goodness of the king who reigns. Let's pray that the spirit would truly empower us. That that we would continue this work heralding the kingdom of Christ to the ends of the earth. As we move into a time where we take the Lord's Supper, the truth is we won't herald to the ends of the earth if we aren't heralding the kingdom to one another. And one simple and yet profound way that Jesus gives us to do that to one another is through the Lord's Supper. It's not the only way that we should be doing it, but it's a way. Paul says that as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. We announce it. We're, we're, we're identifying with it and proclaiming we believe this. We herald the Lord's death. We're, we're His witnesses, witnessing to one another again and again that we believe that Jesus died and was raised that He's the rightful King who reigns and is coming again so that we will live with Him under His benevolent, gracious rule. And so as you come and receive the bread and the cup and take it back to your seats as we sing and we wait to take the elements together, let's think sincerely about Jesus, our King. Let's genuinely think about the kind of king he is and therefore the kingdom that he reigns over. What does his kingdom look like? Whether we display it well or not, what does his kingdom look like? Because of who he is and what he's like. And let's seek to reflect that in our taking of the bread and cup and in our interacting with others after. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you You're so good to us, so gracious, Lord. We confess to you even now, before we sing, before we uh, receive the, the bread and the cup and take it together, Lord, we confess you are king, you alone. You're king of kings, Lord of lords.
There's no one greater, no one who compares to you. And your kingdom is a good, holy, benevolent, merciful, gracious, happy kingdom. Lord, we want to be people who are witnesses to that kingdom, to you, Lord, who hold you high. So we pray for your help, Lord, that we would be people who are guided by the Spirit in these ways. And even now, as we prepare to take the bread and the cup, help us to confess truly. As we proclaim the Lord's death to one another, help us to believe. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.